<laughs> and so if you say it's alphabetical, uh, you, you can start with, you can start reverse alphabet and you say Z, or you can start <laughs> forward alphabet and B. So I think it's going to be you, Zbig. So why don't we start with you and then I'll turn to Brett. Just to give you a reaction to this, and you've been watching this region for so many years. You've talked about the arc of instability. You've looked at the geopolitics of this region coming together. Just your, your insights at this point. Well, <clears throat> what do we see here? is obviously a series of potentially important geopolitical rivalries developing. And it's not, in my view, so much a matter of connectivity between the Far East and the West, sort of one new entity emerging because of the Silk Route, but it's more a matter of determining which way that central space between contemporary Russia and China evolves. And the early indications, I think, are meaningful. They suggest to me that what we are witnessing is, in fact, the progressive expansion of Chinese influence, benign, cooperative, but obviously self-serving. It is also interesting to note that that occurs in a context in which the current Russian leadership under Mr. Putin has very vigorously embraced the idea of the Eurasian Union, Eurasian Union, into which he's trying to engage not only the Central Asian states, but the newly independent post-Soviet states in the West, notably Belarus and Ukraine, neither of which wants to be part of that union because they understand what it means. The Central Asians are more vulnerable because they're much more still dependent on Russian support economically. But it's rather striking that the very imaginative and skillful political leader of Kazakhstan, Nazarbayev, has recently come out with a very subtle suggestion, but a meaningful one, that the Eurasian Union, which he favors, he said, be called the Economic Eurasian Union. <laughs> Very subtle, but rather important difference. And I don't see yet any sign that Putin is embracing it with great enthusiasm. In this very interesting presentation showed us how the president of China, President Xi, has recently become engaged in this process. And it's interesting that there is now a series of Chinese statements, which I brought with me, but I wasn't quite sure how we're going to operate Please. here. Please. Um, that indicate that this is explicitly a strategy of theirs. Westward, the westward movement is a Chinese strategy. And the Chinese rationalize it by the argument, one, it is good for everyone concerned. The Asian, the new Central Asian countries can develop more stably. That's good for Russia. It avoids problems for the Russians. It helps China, obviously, <laughs> because it expands its scope of access to natural resources. And of course, it establishes a Chinese presence. In addition to that, they say, it avoids a head-on rivalry with the United States. China cannot compete with the United States strategically pointing in towards the sea, because the United States is too well entrenched through alliances and Navy presence and so forth to permit that to happen. But the West for China is open for a policy of friendship, accommodation, expansion, growing influence, and of course, that means strategic preponderance eventually. However, they add in their statements quite explicitly that this strategy avoids a collision with Russia because China is not competing with Russia for political influence. China is simply expanding its economic ties with Central Asia. And they leave the rest of the sentence unstated, <laughs> which of course means, yes, we are going to be preeminent economically in the relationship. We will be the clearly decisive partner for these states, but we'll avoid a head-on collision with the Russians. So it's a win-win situation from their point of view, and they're quite explicit on that. I think in these circumstances, the odds favor the Chinese, clearly. The Russian economy is not in a position to compete. It cannot engage in the kind of contractual relationships with the Central Asian countries. It still has some advantage over the Chinese in that it provides more employment for surplus labor from Central Asia, 
which goes to Moscow and some other centers, urban centers in Russia. But there's a downside to that. That breeds social tensions, xenophobia among the Russians, and creates complications of a political sort with the Central Asian countries, which in turn benefits, so to speak, indirectly the Chinese. So I see this presentation less as kind of reconnecting Eurasia as a whole, but more as a regional shift in which the Chinese now can use the assets that they possess peacefully, nonviolently, in a manner which makes it difficult to oppose them, but to expand their strategic significance. Brent, let me turn to you. Uh, <coughs> as usual, I agree with most everything that's big as head. <laughs> I think the, the notion of the new Silk Road is quite an exaggeration. Uh, but, uh, but it's understandable. There is a reopening of, of sorts of the greater economies now from rail routes than before. Uh, and so they are sort of economically competitive. But the notion that the Silk Road is still driven by the things that it was a thousand years ago, or two thousand years ago, uh, I think it's a mistake. But I think we have to look at the motives of China and Russia uh, to see what is really driving this. And it's not really Silk Road oriented. For the Chinese, it is raw materials. The Chinese are, are almost paranoid about the sudden shift, sudden in, in uh, historical terms, sudden shift from being self-sufficient in almost everything, including petroleum, iron ore, all of these things, to being importers. And it frightens them because they have this instinct for self-sufficiency. Uh, and so the Central Asian countries are not first. Look at Africa. Look at, look at what uh, China has been doing in Africa. Uh, building plantations, doing this, doing the other. What for? To occupy? No. Raw materials. And that's what I think their goal is. And, and it's primarily, it's Silk Road in the sense that initially uh, the, one of the biggest raw material providers was Kazakhstan, which is on the, on the west side of it. And so China has been interested in oil pipelines and so on there to make Kazakhstan dependent on China, I think much less than China looking for self-sufficiency again or secure sufficiency in its raw materials. Russia is a very, is, is almost the polar opposite. Russia controlled this territory for a long, long time. And there are really two potential Silk Roads. One is the Trans-Siberian Railroad, and the other is through the South. The Russians have never been much interested in opening either one of them to world <coughs> trade. And that's one of the reasons it's never developed. They have not, the Trans-Siberian has been theirs forever. It still is a rickety old transportation system which could have been modernized and built into an efficient system a long time ago. They weren't interested in that because they didn't want, in my sense, is they didn't want that kind of penetration inside the old Soviet Union that uh, that would have entailed. Then the Soviet Union breaks up under uh, uh, un under Yeltsin. Now the instinct of Putin is to recreate that unit in whatever ways he can. Again, it's not basically economically driven. To me, it is. He thinks. It was a real mistake 
to let the Soviet Union collapse. It should have been kept together. And he is doing whatever he can, as Big says, not only here, but in, in Eastern Europe to strengthen the bonds and to try to hold the system together. He is a reactionary leader in the sense that he, he knows he can't recreate the Soviet Union, but he is doing what he can to keep it the way it is. And therefore, he's not interested in a Silk Road. He's interested in the kind of control that an economic union uh, would give him. Uh, and, and the rudiments are there because all of the roots for centuries have gone from Central Asia into Russia, not East and West. So to me, that's the kind of struggle now. And I think to, to put a Silk Road name on it uh, is taking an, an interesting and to me, very attractive, just the history of the Silk Road under, under all of its different manifestations, uh, whether it's the Mongol invasion, which made it all possible, uh, the rise of the Persian Empire, the rise of the Ottoman Empire, all of these things have transformed it over and over again. But uh, I, I think the Russian attitude and the Chinese attitude are, are very, very different. Now, to me, one of the best examples is uh, Nazarbayev. I first met Nazarbayev when he was the chairman of the Kazakhstan People's Republic of the Soviet Union. And he came to visit me. And uh, he was extolling, at that time, when the Soviet Union was still the Soviet Union, the raw material advantages of uh, better contact with Kazakhstan. And he's an entrepreneur in, in his own distorted sort of way. Uh, and and that's, that's what he is trying to develop. Uh, Kazakhstan is rich in raw materials from uh, petroleum resources uh, to uh, uh, nuclear resources. And uh, it makes it very attractive for him to market. But I think we need to be, we need to look at the broader sense, the historic interests of these countries. And it's not simply to who gets more trade or who gets more political influence. It's both. And the driving factors are different from Moscow to Beijing. OK, thank you. That's what I thought. It was going to be just terrific. Now, everybody grab your little clicker, because I'm going to, we're going to test out the system. I'm going to ask a couple of questions that, and to see if you can read. Uh, we're going to ask a couple of questions. First of all, let's go to the first. Have you personally visited China, yes or no? And if somebody hits D, E, or F, then we'll go out to remedial camp outside. Okay? <laughs> so just, just give us a vote. Well, so we just have a sense. <clears throat> Which is yes. Okay, roughly half and half. Which is yes and which uh, is yes. Uh, the first one is yes. So about 49% have been to China. Mm -hmm. uh, that's now 50. It's you know. now it's okay, let's hear it. Now there it's we 51. go. Okay, people. Yeah. All right. Okay, okay. Okay, so well, you couldn't get more evenly divided than yeah. that. Okay, let's go, to the next, let's go to the next chart. Who has personally visited the Russia Far East? Not Russia, but the Russia Far East. Where's my clicker? <laughs> okay, that doesn't surprise me either. That's, uh, you know, overwhelmingly people know maybe Russia in, in the European Russia, but they don't know the Asian Russia. Okay, let's go to the next chart. How many of you personally visited any of the Central Asian republics? Any? Hmm. That's interesting. That's really interesting. I hadn't thought that we would have a third. Yeah. Yeah. This is an interesting change. That's a, that's a surprise. Good. OK. Um, earlier in the presentation, uh, Andy mentioned the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. 
I don't know how many people here know about it. Uh, Chris, let me ask you just to say a word about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, just so we all get grounded on it. Yeah. Uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization was initially founded as the Shanghai Five in 1996, where we had all of the Central Asian republics, Russia and China, participating except for Uzbekistan. And then in 2001, Uzbekistan joined uh, the group. In 2002, they met in St. Petersburg, Russia, and signed the charter. And since then, of course, they've been having the, the annual meetings. I think from a Chinese perspective, uh, what has been one of the strong limitations of the SCO thus far has been the heavy emphasis on security, anti-terrorism, that sort of element to the relationship. And I just want to echo uh, what both uh, Dr. Brzezinski and General Scowcroft said with regard to how China, what we're seeing in the last month or two, and certainly from Xi Jinping's visit, is a real reorientation of at least the rhetoric of what China is looking to do out there. And I think to some degree we're seeing this across the board from the Chinese perspective as well in that <laughs> What they're doing is taking advantage of Chinese companies that have been operating in the region for some time and trying to apply some grand strategic design to it. Uh, obviously, implementation and follow through will be the, the key there. Uh, and Andy, you mentioned in the presentation you know, that uh, Russia has been trying to organize uh, some economic unions. It started back in 2003. Do you just want to give a little summary for everyone here? Sure. Maybe just another word about the, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I mean, it, it grew out of the uh, uh, the border discussions right. between the three Central Asian republics, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and Russia and China that were involved in the final resolution of that long Sino-Soviet border. And I think that Russia and China have had, have had different visions for the organization with Russia emphasizing more uh, security issues and China emphasizing more economic issues within the, uh, within the org organization. And uh, I think it's the, the differences in their visions that have prevented the organization maybe from developing and doing as much as it uh, could possibly be doing. Now, uh, John's absolutely right. The Russians have had a number of different uh, projects over the last decade or so to promote uh, economic integration in the region. There was the Eurasian uh, Economic Community, which was spawned, what spawned from that then was the uh, common uh, uh, economic space, and more importantly, the Customs Union. Uh, and the Customs un Union was established uh, in in uh, July of 2010, and the and founding three members are Belarus, Russia, and Kazakhstan. And uh, uh, Mr. Putin and the Russians have been trying to uh, uh, recruit, uh, seduce, convince, intimidate <laughs> others to have an interest in joining. An interesting development, for example, was uh, in September, uh, Armenian leader uh, Sarkisyan went to uh, Moscow, and after Armenia really hadn't expressed much of an interest in being a member of the Customs Union, and suddenly it was announced that they did want to become a member of the Customs <laughs> Union after that visit. Um, uh, Tajikistan uh, and Kyrgyzstan, two of the smaller countries in Central Asia, have also expressed uh, an interest. The big prize, of course, is Ukraine, and uh, we have a big meeting for the EU in Vilnius coming up uh, later this month. And it's likely that uh, Ukraine will sign an association agreement with the EU uh, and it will preference uh, the European Union over the customs union. And that will be a big blow to the, uh, to the customs union. I'd say that there are, one hears different kind of visions of these, uh, of the customs union. One, well, Hillary Clinton described it as, a, as an effort to sort of re-Sovietize the region. It's not really, it's not really that. But I think it is an effort uh, uh, on the Russia, led by led by the Russians, to try to take advantage of the economic links that broke down after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, one of the problems with that is that those economic links were all made in under non-market conditions. So, actually, how viable are those links under market conditions is a is a question. It's also been described as an effort to actually to raise the the, the norms and standards of all of the members of the customs union actually to European levels or to promote their accession to the, to the WTO. There may be an element to that. Uh, we'll see how it, how it develops in the, uh, in the future. Um, I think there's a lot of bargaining going on between the members and potential members of the, of the union. And uh, it's not, if Russia tries to uh, use excessive sticks as opposed to carrots uh, in the development of the union, it's really not gonna work, I think. Let me just, just so that people here have heard this, you know, well, this is a region that's been caught between two big countries with very different imperial traditions. 
And the Russian imperial tradition is trying to create a structure. And the Chinese imperial tradition is really creating transactional engagement. You know, it's just very profoundly different. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions here. And again, get your clickers. Uh, let's go to question number, uh, next one, it's number four, I think. OK. How do you think the current economic and political trends will contribute to Asian integration? Economic integration continues. Political integration is resisted. B, economic integration leads to political integration, or economic integration falters. Let everybody kind of cast your vote here. Spick, let me ask you to be the first to react to this. You see, about, uh, well, now it's about two thirds of our colleagues think that economic integration will continue, but it will foster resistance to political integration. I agree with that one. I'm just looking at my list, which I checked off this morning for these questions. That's one I checked off, too. So everybody got it right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I was a student, I would have liked to have been right. I mean, but, you know, congratulations, two-thirds of you, well, okay? Well, the others are a little more kind of catastrophic, inevitable, falter, et cetera. So I think A is the more sensible. <laughs> Brent, where are you? I think A is more sensible. I'm not sure it's going to happen. I'm not sure economic integration will necessarily increase because the, the states of Central Asia, if that's what you mean by economic integration, are not drawn necessarily to closer each. to each other, but they're drawn either to Moscow or Beijing. So I'm not sure any of those answers is, is the best one. Okay, I didn't give you a choice. So, <laughs> so if anybody wants I to be one, a friend D. of Brent's, put D. Okay, well, okay. Okay, let, let's go to the next chart. And this is, um, which of the following do you think represents Russia's primary interest in Central Asia? Energy resources, geopolitical balance, buffering radical Islamic forces, counterbalancing China. Now, obviously, you'd like to push D, E, which is all the above, but I'm not going to let you. I need, I need to get some differential. Well, somebody hit E. OK, geopolitical balance. Zbig, is that your view about Russia's interests in Central Asia? Well, I have to say I don't understand that point, actually. Geopolitical balance between Russia and Tajikistan? <laughs> That doesn't make much sense to me. Yeah. Or is it a geopolitical balance between Russia and China? I think it's Russia and China. Well, then I think that's part of it. But it's also very much like D, counterbalancing the influence of China. So ultimately, if you want it clear and simple, I would say it's D. Everybody want to change their votes now that you've heard what the... <laughs> well, speak. I, or I, I would change B to geopolitical control rather than balance. I don't think the Russians want balance. <laughs> You've got to balance with somebody, and I don't think they want balance with China. They don't want China in there. So uh, uh, in, in, a, in a sense, it's, it's D, but I don't think the Russians look at it that way. They're trying to keep China out, not counterbalance it. Well, you know, Putin famously said, and I think it tells us a great deal about his worldview, that the greatest historical calamity of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. Yes. Just think of what that sentence and means. We need to remember that. World War I, World War II, the Cold War, uh, the horrible crimes committed and millions of people killed. No, it's the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was never an economic enterprise. <laughs> it was a political enterprise, <laughs> ideological <laughs> enterprise. <laughs> okay, let's, let's go to the next chart, which you will recognize the answers. Let's see if you're the question. The question is, which do you think represents China's primary interest? Expanding markets, creating favorable geopolitical balance. In other words, they'd control, I guess, would be the thing. Creating a buffer against radical Islam, counterbalancing the influence of Russia. Yeah. I, well, None the of question? the above. None Access the, to raw materials. Access to raw materials? 
Okay, yeah. if, if anyone wants that, hit E. <laughs> 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 Clearly we missed an option. <laughs> I feel like I'm at a telethon. Okay, we can get over the top. <laughs> Yeah, well, you can't vote twice because it cancels your other one. So I just want you to know, you, if you, somebody's trying to cheat. Okay, okay that's interesting. Uh, re, re, and then I'll, I'll ask Ed to react to this on the energy front. But Brent, you start. Well, I, I think A is, is not generally a Chinese goal. They're not seeking moral markets. They're importers. They, they've got the market they want. They're not out driving to sell things around the world. And so I think A is, is really not an alternative. And if you watch when you put an E in there, uh, it drew some mm -hmm. from A. So uh, I, I think it's access to raw materials mm -hmm. that they're after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ed, do you want to just say, you've been in the oil business a long time, and you know Central Asia better than it's, anybody. It's all world. about oil and gas, according to that. <laughs> um, yes, uh, I mean, I, I think we need a little bit more perspective than just to look at the Russia-China angle, it seems to me. I think it's a much more multifaceted game. Uh, I think we perhaps overlooked the fact that in the 1990s, when the Soviet Union collapsed, at least in the energy sphere, it was Western oil companies that first went to uh, places like Kazakhstan. Yeah. Um, and, and it was because at that time, the West and the United States included, were the ones desperately needing access to additional incremental supplies of oil and gas into the world market. Didn't really matter whether that oil and gas flowed to the United States or not, as a major, as the major importer, uh, it was in our interest to create more supply. Well, just two months ago, China replaced the United States as the largest oil importer in the world. In, the, uh, in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, I was working and living in Beijing at the time. China, as General Scowcroft mentioned, was still a net oil exporter at the time. Well, since 1992, 1993, China has become the largest oil importer in the world. And it's increasingly relying on imported um, um, uh, gas as well to supply their needs. So that they have basically replaced what was our position in the 1990s in the global oil and gas world. Uh, the other factor that we should keep in mind is that unlike the old Silk Road days, uh, the Central Asian countries themselves are no longer uh, the, the objects only of, uh, of policy uh, and, and interests, but also they are themselves the subjects of, uh, the, the, that can guide their own destiny. So it's really a question of in this multifaceted world, and we might include India and Iran as, as part of that equation uh, as well, how will business be done in the oil and gas world? I think it's very interesting as part of Xi Jinping's visit, President Xi Jinping's visit to Kazakhstan, it was announced that a Chinese company, uh, the China National Petroleum Corporation, bought into 112 uh, equity interests in the largest, at least most expensive, oil field development uh, in the world that is namely Kashigan in, in, in Kazakhstan where they will be partners with the Exxon Mobiles and the Shells and the ENIs uh, and the Totals of the world. Will business be done in a international, according to international business practices? Will business be done in a peculiar Chinese way? Mm. Will, or will business be done in the old fashioned Russian way in this part of the world is something that's bear watching. Clearly it's in our interest that it's been be done in a modern, uh, with modern business practice uh, and, and in a, uh, under international standards, as I believe is in the interest of the countries of Central Asia uh, uh, as well. But we'll have to see, and we have a, a stake in that game as well. Okay, let's go, let's go to the next question, Will, and that is, uh, who do you think is winning the competition for influence in Central Asia? <laughs> e? Help me with that one, folks. 
Ah. It's big. I think this got to what you were saying earlier. <laughs> is that... Well, I think this shows the audience is very well informed, very intelligent. <laughs> 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 to be complimented. <laughs> and they did listen to you. <laughs> Which is good. Okay, let's, let, let, let me go to the next set of uh, charts. And this is, what do you think, let's go to the next one here. Well, uh, what are the factors that constitute the biggest obstacles for Central Asia uh, interior playing greater roles? Uh, is it physical infrastructure, human resources, internal political institutional bureaucratic problems, or security challenges? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that shows the wisdom of this audience. Yeah. That's an obvious one. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know what E is. On uh, this all I think the above. that's uh, probably all the above. People are going for all the above here. Uh, I mean, Ed, yeah. again, you, you, again, you travel a lot there, and then I'd like each of our three experts just to make a commentary about this here from your different perspectives, from energy perspective, from a China perspective, from a Russia perspective. I, I, I think in terms of intra-regional trade, General Scowcroft is absolutely correct. I mean, the old Soviet system has collapsed, and nothing has replaced it. So the kind of relationships that, for example, that uh, Tajikistan had with Uzbekistan on trading water for electricity, that system has collapsed. And, and in some ways, that's good because that was done in, the, in barter trade in a very non-transparent way. But nothing has been built to replace that. And it really is the barriers uh, and the tensions within the region that's causing it not to happen. And anything we can do to help that regional, intra-regional integration would also allow the region to play a larger role in international commerce as well. Chris? Uh, I'd just say, uh, let me make one comment on the previous question. I mean, I absolutely agree, obviously, that the raw materials issue is the driver. But I do think it's interesting to see that we might be seeing a bit of a shift here uh, with the, the new policies that, that we see Xi Jinping uh, taking on. There's been a real debate in China's strategic community about whether all that acti economic activity needs to be nested in some sort of a larger strategic design. And I think that line of thinking is starting to catch on within their system. So I guess I would just temper the idea that it will remain forever solely about resources. I've and I would just pick up on what Dr. Brzezinski said earlier with regard to the idea that they have seen that in the eastern region and toward the sea, they are handicapped by U.S. alliances, pre-existing uh, conditions there, and so on. It will always be difficult. To the west, they have a wide open playing field where the U.S. is not as, uh, is not as highly regarded as it is uh, uh, to the east, and so on. So I think that's what's shaping and guiding their view. I think the restriction is always going to be their strong desire to kind of put their own emphasis or spin over the collective. You know, that's going to be a real limitation, I think, because we have all these other contrasting points of view involved. Andy? Well, first of all, let me say what a brilliant audience we have. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we did some studies here a few years ago looking at the Northern Distribution Network, uh, new transit corridors to uh, supply non-lethal uh, equipment to our forces in Afghanistan. About 85 plus percent of what is supplied is non-lethal materials, and it's all done through commercial, commercial carriers. And one of the surprising findings I found was that, uh, uh, you know, what was the biggest obstacle to getting material into Afghanistan? Was it the lack of physical infrastructure? There actually are no railroads, at least at that time, into Afghanistan. Now there's one. No. Was it the security problems? No. What a great statistic that uh, Transcom uh, told me, that the, uh, the, the loss rate of material going into Afghanistan was lower than loss rates in Bayonne County, New Jersey. <laughs> now, you could have selected a number of other different, different counties in the United States. I don't mean to pick on New Jersey, but that's the case. It's by far and away the internal political institutional bureaucratic problems. And there are scads of reports done by uh, the UN, the Asian Development Bank, the uh, European Bank on Reconstruction and Development, other institutions, that this is by far and away the biggest obstacle to materials moving. And it kind of boils down to borders acting like toll booths. The, the problem is the question of cost and also the unpredictability of time. And that's the biggest obstacle to the, the land transit really getting more momentum. And here I think what Ed was pointing to with the intra-regional cooperation 
uh, in Central Asia, also in uh, the South Caucasus, uh, that is going to be so, so important. So you see a number of states like Kazakhstan, uh, Azerbaijan in the South Caucasus, even Turkmenistan, kind of thinking of themselves as transit hubs, partially as a way to diversify their economy over the long term and be less dependent upon uh, the oil and gas resources. Uh, Speaking did you, do either of the two of you want to comment on what you've just heard about this, and this, this question of how the Central Asian states are themselves thinking, because it pre kind of prejudges. Well, isn't that the next? Right, well, let's do the, well, let's go to the next chart. Isn't that let's the get, next question, basically? Let's ask the next chart here. Yeah. So, I think the, so where do the like Central Asian one. states, this is assuming that they're wanting to preserve political maneuver room and still take advantage of economic development. Where do they turn to increase their independence and autonomy? Is it possible to say to none of the above? <laughs> it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll let them finish voting until they find out how wrong they are. And then, uh, then you can correct this here. Go ahead, speak. Why don't you well, give I think reaction? None of the above. Look, if you are a part of the Central Asian political elite, and you have been, quote unquote, independent now for 25 years, what do you enjoy the most? Well, you enjoy the most, first of all, the sense of independence and the perks that goes with it. You're a president, you're a general, you're a minister, you're an ambassador. How many of them really want to be employees of some sort of Eurasian Union with a capital in Moscow? Zilch. Secondly, you want your country to be prosperous. Well, where is the nearest source of prosperity for them? It's inevitably China. India may enter and play the role, but that's going to take a long time. There are geographical handicaps and political handicaps. Iran, up to a point, if it rehabilitates itself and its relationship with us of some sort, that's also a long road. China's there, and China's being extremely careful not to give its presence a political cast, a political cast. But nonetheless, that presence is mounting. I went to Kyrgyzstan for the first time in my life in the 50s when I was a graduate student at Harvard. The capital of that country was not what it is today. It's now called Bishkek. It was then called Frunze in honor of a Soviet general. And the chief, the main street in Frunze, the capital of Kyrgyzstan, was called the Lenin Prospect. <laughs> I was in Kyrgyzstan when it became independent. The capital was called Bishkek. That street was now called the Deng Xiaoping Prospect. <laughs> <laughs> Tells you something. I wonder how the Russians feel when they you know, drive on that prospect. Yeah. Right. Uh, I think that uh, the Turks would like, like it to be A. And they have, a, they have made a major Big effort yep. to try to be the presence in the region not tied to either China or Russia or the US necessarily but to be an independent sort of Central Asian kind of thing. It's not working all that yeah. well. <laughs> Brent, you, you, you are as knowledgeable and as close to Turkey as anybody I know. Why have they not been more successful, what do you think? Well, I think, you know, you can't reconstruct the old Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's sort of what they've been trying to do as an economic goal. Mm -hmm. There just aren't the ties left and there's not, Turkey is not a commanding enough economic or geopolitical entity uh, to make it work. That's, that's my sense of it. But the Turks have been trying very hard. Mm -hmm. Yes, they have. Yeah. Uh, Annie, you want to? Let's make a, a comment about Iran in this respect. I think if we look at Iran in this equation, simply from the standpoint of, of transit, uh, for Central Asia, Iran in that regard, I think, is, is rather attractive. It's the straightest shot uh, to get to um, either the port of Chabahar, to Bandar Abbas, to get to the sea and get, get things out. And in fact, actually, I remember four years ago when we went down to uh, Central Command in Tampa to talk to them about the various routes they were thinking about for uh, the Northern Distribution Network. The one that they really got a gleam in their eye about was actually going through Iran because it is the shortest route uh, and there's actually a fair amount of inf infrastructure there, but of course, for political reasons, it wasn't really uh, uh, a viable option. 
and became less viable, less viable shortly. So I think that's something to keep in mind. And, and I think actually on this, this, you know, the United States has a certain vision of the quote unquote Silk Road that uh, we've been promoting. Uh, and it's primarily linking Central Asia through Afghanistan, Pakistan, and, Pakistan and, and India, which is important for, uh, for economic and strategic reasons. But I think uh, it may be not, not so attractive for some reasons, as particularly to the cent Central Asians, uh, you know, given their experience in Afghanistan, uh, going back to the, uh, the Soviet-Afghan war, and then the looking at Afghanistan and their concern about security uh, there. Yeah. Uh, the only problem with Iran uh, from an oil and gas standpoint for the Central Asian countries is do you really want to transit your oil and gas through a country that has even more oil and gas than you do? Uh, so it's a little bit like you know, transiting all your, all your oil and gas through Russia. So I think the answer, at least in oil and gas terms for the Central Asian countries, is maybe not none of the above, but all of the above. Mm, as right. many directions for oil and gas flows that can be economically viable. Um, and and you know, there, there are reasons to be skeptical uh, about uh, the, uh, the Turkmenistan, um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India route. But at the end of the day, a policy needs to uh, be uh, supported by real projects that are viable and can't just be a slogan. Uh, and, and I think this is where uh, the United States, if it really wants to build, be part of building uh, a new Silk Road or, or regional integration, whatever, have to really focus and concentrate on economically viable project. And, agree that India is, in the, in the very long run, uh, a, a, a um, um, end market that we should not ignore. It will take time. But uh, you know, it, it is possible that we will get there uh, if the economics are there uh, and commercial companies are interested in pursuing them. I think uh, you know, if the United States was really smart, we would be supporting a pipeline under the Caspian Sea. Uh, to bring the oil of Central Asia through without Iran being able to block. Uh, Ambassador Umarov, we've been talking about you all morning. Do you want to jump in here? Would you like to say just a word about this at this stage? Here, let me give you, you got to use a microphone. Okay. It's a, a very interesting discussion, actually. And uh, uh, what I think is missing here is the U.S. policy. <laughs> towards the uh, Eurasia, because uh, we are talking about other countries, but what the U.S. is doing and what U.S. are thinking about it, this is one. The second thing, I think, uh, I very much support the, uh, the project, which right now is in kind of uh, conceiving stage, uh, uh, what Central Asian countries themselves think, uh, what will be their future, and how they perceive, uh, how they build uh, their perspective in the future. I think this is very important, and this is uh, that will show probably uh, different charts and different ways uh, how people think in Central Asia what will be they doing. So I would be uh, very much interested in having the same kind of discussion after this kind of project will be done, and uh, then we can analyze and say what is going to be in Central Asia and Eurasia as a whole. Because uh, at this point of time, I think some of the charts misses some of the points. And uh, in most of them, I would uh, go for E, saying that all of the issues can be uh, a critical for Central Asia and uh, the rest of the countries. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. That wasn't scripted. He didn't know I was going to do that. Um, <laughs> but he did, uh, and, and if, but if we did, if we put E on there, all the above, every answer would have been all the above. I mean, so we're just trying to get a little bit of diversity in this. Let, uh, well, let's skip the next one and then just go to the last one because of what I'd like. Can you do that? Is that possible? Uh, just skip this one because I think we've basically hit this. Okay. So you asked, Ambassador, <laughs> what 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 is America's policy here? So let's let's ask people to vote. Stay out since we don't know what the hell we're doing. Find allies and try to grow our presence. Actively promote commercial activity, but keep out of politics. And stay cool and let nature take its course. <laughs>
Well, that's interesting. I'm making you choose. That's why. Right. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to get a little bit of flavor. This is interesting. Okay. Uh, Zbig, let me start with you. Uh, are you surprised by this? Uh, yeah, I'm a little surprised that uh, there are as many for B as, uh, as there are on, this, uh, on the screen. Uh, I thought the probability was that the C and D either actively promote commercial activity for American companies which is kind of in the American spirit. Let's make money, let's do business. And D, keep cool and let nature take its course, would be the predominant answers. Uh, well, you know, I think that C probably is the most sensible answer, actually, as a practical matter. We're not going to be the decisive geopolitical influence in Central Asia and in the region immediately around it. That's going to be determined by what happens in China, what happens in Russia, what happens in these countries. So I think, in that sense, C is probably the best answer. Mm -hmm. Brent, where would you be? Uh, D sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? You know, we almost never do that. <laughs> yeah, it's not our nature. Well, we never yeah. do that. And, and, and that's a course of action which usually succeeds. Nature is going to take its course anyway. So, uh, no, but I think uh, uh, basically C is, uh, uh, yeah, if we, if we can help, if we can help American business, if we can do something useful, I think we should. But I, I don't think we ought to start to mine that region for geopolitical or economic uh, mm -hmm. rewards. Yeah, I think that would be a formula for, for failure so. yeah. if we were to try to pretend that we had a role in that regard. Yeah, but, can. you know, letting our companies lead the way and help create opportunities there would be a good thing for everybody. That's what we're about, yeah. Okay, let me just go, uh, it, we'll get some wrap up here. Andy, we'll start with you and then I'll come back to our principles here. Well, I'd like to take this question to Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and hear what their, what their response is. And uh, my suspicion is that it's, it's some kind of combination of, of, of B and C uh, as, as well. But I think, you know, for the, this, we're talking about 22 years now of, of independence uh, for these states in Central Asia. Until 9-11, for the first 10 years or so, we were basically, our policy was basically, well, you know, we tell you what we think is right for your development domestically, economically, and, and politically, and, and we want you to do that, and we're going to help you to do that. And then 9-11 happened, and our policy was basically, well, what can you do to support us in the war in Afghanistan? Uh, now we're pulling out of Afghanistan, and so it is an opportunity to go back to the region itself and say, actually, what would you like to see the American role uh, to be? Um, I think there is a demand for, for some kind of role for us, for us there, I think it, my suspicion is it may be more heavily economically weighted as to security weighted, but you know, I think we have to go there and with very open minds and listen to what they have, what they have to say. You know, the other thing I would, I would conclude with is that, you know, so we talk about the, the pivot to Asia that we're undergoing. Well, you know, for understandable historical and cultural reasons, you know, Americans think of Asia as the Asia Pacific. Well, if the, Asia, if the Asia pivot is supposedly mostly about managing the rise of China, we should keep in mind that the Chinese don't think of Asia in those terms. I mean, they think about what's north of them. They think about what's west of them. They think about what's southwest of them. And of course, what's east of them. And what's east is probably the higher priority for sure. But still, it's in this kind of more 19th century British continental sense that I think the China views, views its Asia, and I think that it, it behooves us to think in terms, uh, in those terms as well. Chris? Yeah, I would just like to say that I'm, I'm pleased from the China perspective, I'm pleased at how balanced the discussion has been today. You know, when Xi Jinping took his trip to the region, all the headlines, of course, were they're destroying the United States in, in Central Asia and so on, and, you know, this is the Chinese horde. Not to horde. speak of the Russians. <laughs> uh, not, this is the Chinese horde coming. So I'm encouraged by the fact that people understand the, 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 the incentives for the Chinese to move in this direction, but I think there's also a good appreciation for the limits, and I think that's very important. You know, a lot of what they've done out 
out there so far is still quite aspirational, and I think it will probably stay that way for some period of time because they largely understand that time is on their side with this one. Yep. Uh, well, as a sometimes industry practitioner, uh, I'm really pleased that C came out ahead uh, <laughs> on this. Uh, the only thing I would say is that even C on the part of the U.S. government requires an action plan. It cannot just be limited to talk of strategy, of, of, of nice slogans, but it actually requires identifying strategic project that would, be, would advance that policy goal and how to work with the private sector in close coordination uh, in order to make it happen, whether it's the Trans-Caspian uh, pipeline that General Scowcroft mentioned or the TAPI pipeline that, that I talked about. It's, it's insufficient uh, to, to give it only rhetorical support, and we have to work closely with the governments in the region uh, as well to, to make it happen. And in fact, just before uh, I came to this meeting, I had a meeting with the, uh, an official in the National Security uh, Council staff on precisely that point of how do you actually uh, have action steps that lead to the policy goal that the United States seem to want to have in the region. Okay, we're really kind of at the end for some larger framing thoughts. And uh, Brett, let me start with you, how you would choose to help us think about this morning here, this conversation. Well, on, on, on this question, if, if I were one of the Central Asian republics, I would choose option C because it seems to me they're uneasy with an overwhelming Chinese presence. They're uneasy with an overwhelming Russian presence. We're far enough away, distant enough in, in every respect. We'd be a nice counterbalancing uh, entity. Uh, I, think that, uh, I think that's been a good discussion today. I think it... Uh, it clarifies what a lot of people think in general terms, but without, without really penetrating what are the elements here in the future. And I, I would say in general, I think the U.S. fundamental interest in this region is continued geopolitical independence, but in making the resources of the region available for uh, world commerce. Dr. B? I think what we have been talking about is on the whole positive from the US point of view. I think the increasing influence of China is having essentially a stabilizing effect on the region. I think that will help Russia accommodate itself to these realities even though the present leadership may feel uneasy about them and would like in some way to reverse them. I think it may help to create wider economic interdependence because of the access, the Silk Route and so forth. But we also have to take into account one unpredictable kind of dynamic factor which looms on the horizon as a potential reality and a disturbing one, <coughs> namely whether in the wake of the American disengagement from Afghanistan, there isn't going to be an intensification of socio-political conflicts within the region, and particularly because of the sectarian dynamics. I don't want to give it a particular label. I think we, the United States, made a terrible mistake by calling the war on terror a war on jihadist terror because jihad is a holy war in Islamic uh, concepts. So we have to be very careful about the language we use, but some sort of sectarian violence is quite likely in the region, given the inherent vulnerability of some of these governments. And they're becoming more and more concerned about that. And here, it is also quite possible that if on other issues, we find it more possible to work more closely with the Chinese and work more closely with the Russians. I have particularly in mind the problems we face in Syria and vis-a-vis -vis Iran. We may be in a better position after our disengagement to collaborate together in trying to contrive some arrangements that are stabilizing to Central Asia. 
because otherwise a number of Central Asian governments, I'm not going to single them out, but at least three or four, are potentially quite vulnerable right now to any sudden outburst of sectarian violence. And even the Chinese would not have a problem with Islam internally because the Islamic presence in China is minuscule, are very worried about it spilling over into China, Xinjiang, obviously. And this could have also implications for southern Russia. So in a sense, there is the possibility of some geopolitical collaboration if we, in the meantime, are somewhat successful in dealing jointly with the more immediate problems that we face in Syria and in Iran, which, if badly handled, could have a further intensifying dynamic on what is likely, in any case, to be a rather complicating, complicated phase after we disengage from Afghanistan. Okay, I've got just a few minutes where we can take some questions from the floor. Uh, we've got people with microphones, and so just put your hand up if you want to ask something. And yeah, right, right behind, right behind you. Right. Uh, thank you. My name is Batu Kutelia. I'm from Georgia. I represent McCain Institute. Uh, uh, just a brief comment on the Russians' attempt to balance um, uh, and who's trying to balance in Central Asia. I think the only country Russia is trying to balance in Central Asia or anywhere else uh, is U.S., whether U.S. is present there or, or not that actively. And my question is that uh, in late 90s, there was a quite visible uh, strategy towards Central Asia from the U.S. side, there was a Silk Road, a new Silk Road Strategy Act sponsored by uh, Senator Brownback, if I'm not mistaken. There was a big military uh, uh, exercise under the PFP umbrella called the Central Asian Battalion uh, with the uh, U.S. military lead. Uh, and now we had a question, what should be the American uh, policy or strategy towards region? And my question is, uh, what is uh, today uh, U.S. Uh, strategy or policy towards Central Asia because it's not quite visible. Thank you. Brett, do you, the question is what is America's strategy to Central Asia? Do you feel we have one? I believe, no, I don't think we have a collective strategy towards Central Asia. We have one toward, uh, uh, toward individual countries uh, like uh, Georgia especially. Uh, but I don't think we have a general one. If, if we were to develop one, or if circumstances force us to develop one, I agree with Big that it is likely to be uh, Islamist-oriented uh, in some way. Uh, right now, I think that's a potential, not a serious actual threat, but it could develop, uh, it could develop into one. Um. Right down here. Yep. Uh, Colin Clark, Breaking Defense. Uh, John, congratulations on a fabulous building. Oh, thank you. I'm uh, the the one piece of all this that I haven't heard discussed a lot is the uh, balancing act that uh, China is going to have to do between you know, with Japan on its one side and all our other allies and this group. I mean, yes, to some degree, the Wild West is open to them, but uh, can they deploy enough resources uh, to really make a large difference or, uh, or not? Dr. Brzezinski, do you want to take that? Do you, does, does China have the capacity to manage both a, an eastward and a westward engagement strategy? Well, the one we're talking about today doesn't really no. involve enormous commitments. No. Uh, they're dealing with players yeah. that are very much in need of foreign investment and, of course, who find it useful to have Chinese involvement for other reasons, as we discussed. So I don't think at this stage the Chinese face any fundamental geostrategic either-or decisions. Uh, in the long run, a great deal depends on whether the American-Chinese relationship remains stable and cooperative. And they're countervailing pressures, uh, very countervailing pressures. On the one hand, officially, both sides are making a lot of noise about establishing a new type of relationship between two sort of major powers that attempts to stabilize the dynamics of that relationship. On the other hand, the fact is that anti-Chinese sentiments in our press, mass media, are becoming more widespread, in particular also in Congress. 
And the fact is that surprisingly, in the Chinese mass media, which are government controlled, there are more and more scathing articles about America's world role, really scathing, very sharp. And one has to sort of ask oneself, what is more the official policy? The statements about the partnership and accommodation, a new type of a relationship, or the really strident condemnations of America's world role as being negative, destructive, selfish, irresponsible. I hope it's the former. But it obviously is a sign of some internal hesitations and uncertainties about the dynamics of this relationship. Chris, Chris did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just would amplify that by agreeing with all of it and then also just suggesting, too, that we not lose sight of the fact that economic development in China is increasingly moving out toward the West. And so that will create its own realities for how that balancing act gets sorted out between. Uh, and Andy, did you want to jump in? I've got two questions down here. Well, I just want to, to respond to Ambassador Hutelius question. He's very modest, He's a former uh, Georgian ambassador to the United States. Uh, I, I agree. I don't think there is a U.S. policy toward, toward Central Asia right, right now. We have a strategic goal, I think, that we need to think about, and that is how to best promote the independence and sovereignty of these states. That has always been the number one strategic goal, okay? But then with the goal, there has to be actually a strategy to execute it. And what's different, and we got away from that, uh, frankly, for the last 12 years, since the policy was derivative to the war in Afghanistan. We have an opportunity now to, to review that, but the world has changed a lot in the last 12 years. China's in a much stronger position, actually Russia's in a stronger position than it was 12 years ago. There are other rising powers in, in the region, and uh, that's why I think uh, it's important now for us to actually take the time and uh, try to get a sense of what uh, the region is looking for from us, and particularly what we want to, want to do with the region. Okay, right down in the front, I've got one, and then one right behind. Uh, well, okay, you, you, get, you stole the microphone, you go first. No, that's okay, no, 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 and then we'll come down the fact, and then it'll be over. Uh, Steve Winters, local researcher. Uh, in terms of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SCO, uh, the Chinese seem to have state that they see this as a new style of, uh, of regional alliances. Uh, the Chinese state has a no alliance policy. Does, does their view, CO is some kind of innovative new direction in, in uh, regional organizations make any sense, or is this just uh, propaganda? Yeah. Well, first of all, I don't think they see it as an alliance. Uh, you know, they, my sense is that they see it as an opportunity to, uh, there certainly was a flavoring to it when it was initially created of being some sort of a counterbalance to other uh, organizations. But I think as they've watched it devolve over time, they've understood it can't possibly function that way. What's been really interesting to watch is how the Chinese have reacted to the various proposals to bring some of the observers in as formal members. They've been quite hostile to that. Um, and so I think that tells you a lot about the limitations of it acting as some sort of alliance relationship. And the last question, right in the very front, and then, uh, on, yeah, yeah, great. Thank you, Gero Schlies, Deutsche Welle German Television. Uh, I think the last weeks we heard a lot about the transatlantic relationship, but uh, today um, I'm a bit disappointed, not in this context of this um, discussion today, but um, when we think about Central Asia, wouldn't it be worthwhile to develop a common strategy uh, with Europe for Central Asia? Asia. So what's your sense about this, to do this, to uh, find common ground with Europe and to develop a common project for Central Asia? Uh, I think the answer is clearly yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is there a longer answer? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you guys do you, are good. Do you want to, get, Dr. B, do you want to get into, do you really think no? Is this something? Well, that... look, we have a number of opportunities of working more closely with Europe, uh, but we're not addressing the ones that are more urgent, uh, which pertain, let's say, to our transatlantic relationship, the possibility of a trade pact, the enhancement of security cooperation, the stabilization of various problems that haunt them and us, including in recent times. <laughs> Sure, of course, but it's not, I would say, a priority item. It's, it's not a rejection, but it's a not now. 
<laughs> okay, I guess it's a, but it's a very fair, fair question. Uh, I've got a couple of just short announcements and before I let you thank these people with your applause. The first is, again, remember that these little clickers have an explosive charge. You will regret <laughs> walking out with them, so leave them on your chair. Uh, that's just a joke. Um, second, uh, we're, you know, they're old saying you get what you pay for. Well, since you're all here and you didn't pay, you're not getting much for lunch. But we do have lunch outside. <laughs> we got some sandwiches. You can grab a bite to eat. Uh, and then we will come back. We're, we're going to break into our four parallel seminars. Uh, in, in this room right here, we're going to do the question, can a U.S.-Iran deal work? Uh, right next door up here is going to be what battlefield lessons have we learned from 12 years of war. <coughs> on the first floor, it's new energy, new geopolitics. And down on the concourse level, what role should financial power play in national security? Now, would you please thank with these people with your applause.